Chapter 26 The next day, school was practically silent. There was none of the usual boisterous shouting and jiving in the halls before homeroom. The buzz of conversation had been replaced with the occasional sound of a hiccuping sob. Jazz wondered how they would all feel if they knew that Jenny's death, as devastating as it had been to them, was only one pearl in a bloody strand. In two more days, a woman with the initials IH would die. She would be sexually assaulted, invaded both vaginally and rectally, then injected with burnt drain cleaner, the penultimate victim to be so injected, imposed via a system of nails and fishing line so that she stood in a hotel shower as though washing. That's what Billy had done as the artist, and that's what the impressionist would do, down to a T, adding only the subtraction of six fingers for his own sick reasons. Waiting for the first bell in homeroom, Jess flipped open a notebook to a fresh page and started scribbling names and facts, hoping that his writing hand would figure out what his brain could not. But nothing connected. Nothing worked. He had only two real suspects, Erickson and Weathers. It could be either one, but neither of them fit exactly. He didn't even bother writing down G. William's name, his cheeks again flushing briefly with the embarrassing memory of suspecting the sheriff. He thought, too, of Jeff Fulton, Harriet Klein's father, but quickly discarded him. It was possible, in theory, that the man's grief had pushed him over the edge, but grief usually didn't take that sort of form. If Fulton had been driven that crazy, he'd be more likely to try to kill Jazz or Billy, not to replicate Billy's crimes. In addition, he realized there was no reason the killer should be some one Jazz knew. The odds were that it was a complete stranger, which meant that he had a lot of information and no conclusions, as usual. All classes, the principal's voice boomed over the PA. Please observe a moment's silence for Miss Davis. Other than a stifled sob, Jazz's home room went utterly silent. Two days. Two days until another murder. The Impressionist was stalking Lobo's nod, and Jazz couldn't think of a single thing to do to stop him. He texted G. William. Any updates? Surreptitiously using Howie's cell under his desk. But the moment silence ended and classes began with no response. It went that way all day. He checked the phone obsessively, certain that he'd missed some sort of notification due to his unfamiliarity with the gadget. But no matter how he tapped, poked, swiped, or manhandled the thing, no message from G. William came up. He suffered the school day in silence and solitude, keeping to himself even more than usual, avoiding eye contact. By now, everyone knew that he'd been present at Jenny's death. As he'd predicted, that bad news had been deduced and spread overnight. The only thing they didn't know was that Jenny's death was connected to others. G. William was still waiting for the VICAP report to come back from the FBI. That would officially connect the first murder in Lindenburg to the others. Then he would go public. So the cops were pretending that the body in the field and the dead waitress and the dead teacher had nothing to do with one another. There was a lot of murders for little Lobo's nod, a lot of suspicion. Jazz wore the heavy cloak of that suspicion all day. He'd been an idiot to think he could just be a normal kid. The past four years, he'd been fooling himself in the worst possible way. First, when Billy was arrested, there had been sympathy. Then, that had withered away, and now only suspicion remained. It would never change. It would never go away. People didn't trust him. They would never trust him. And he could scarcely blame them. Someone else would have been able to save Jenny, he knew or at least would have had some sick part of him enjoying her death. Since Jenny's death, of course, there hadn't been a play rehearsal. But Connie dragged Jazz to Eddie Vigaro's house right after school for a meeting of the cast and crew. He stood in a corner and said nothing, certain that no one in the room could abide his presence. It took a long time before anyone could speak. There were too many tears. 
Jas wished he could join them, wished he could cry, wished he could tell them all about Jenny's last moments in some way that would help them and not seem morbid. We need to honor her, Connie said. She meant so much to us. Everyone agreed and tears gave way to words spoken with the urgency of the desperate in the morning. A plaque, someone suggested, and Jazz flinched despite himself. That's lame, the girl playing Abigail scoffed. We should build a statue. Jazz fidgeted. A plaque? A statue? Trophies. Maybe a whole series of statues, said the kid playing Giles Corey, like for each role she played in college or something. That generated an exciting babble among the cast and crew, a babble that stilled only when a strong voice cut in. Do you really want to honor her memory? Everyone looked at Jazz in surprise. He hadn't meant to speak, but he couldn't help himself, and now he had to keep going because they were all staring. Look, he said, hesitant at first but gaining confidence with each word. If you want to memorialize her, you don't do it with a with a thing. That's not what life is about. Life isn't about gloves, an iPod, a driver's license, a lipstick, the things we own. If you want to honor someone, you don't do it with things. You do it with action. They were still staring, but the stares were no longer of surprise. They were of curiosity. He told them his idea. There was a candlelight vigil on the school football field at sundown that evening. Connie insisted that Jazz attend, although the last thing in the world he wanted was to attend a celebration of a life he had failed to preserve. It felt somehow ghoulish and hypocritical. They're all looking at me, he whispered to her as they settled into their spots in the crowd. Around them it seemed as though every warm body in the school had gathered jockeying for position in near silence. And it wasn't just kids. Half the town had come out for the vigil. Didn't you notice? No one's looking. They are. Because they know you tried to save her. Because they know you found her. They blame me, he said. No one blames you. You should, he did not say. Your idea was brilliant, she said, leaning in close and nodding him. I'm so proud of you. It'll be a lot of work, he cautioned. We'll see if we can pull it off. We can. I know we... Oh, they're starting. The vigil began with Principal Jeffries making some remarks about hiring Jenny, how it felt like a risk. This young, dynamic teacher fresh out of school with all sorts of crazy ideas about teaching. But in the end, the real risk, he claimed, would have been not to hire her. He droned on. Jazz wondered what the point was. Was telling him how wonderful Jenny had been supposed to somehow make him feel better about her being dead? That didn't make any sense. All around him, he was surrounded by tears and outright weeping, kids and adults alike. Principal Jeffries opened up the podium to anyone who wanted to speak. A few students stumbled into the microphone. A college friend of Jenny said a few words. And then there... To Draza's surprise was Jeff Fulton. I'm sorry. I hope I'm not intruding on your town's grief, but I feel in a small way as though maybe God brought me here for this purpose. You see, a few years ago, a man from Lobo's Nod killed my daughter, Harriet. Fulton didn't say Billy's name. He didn't need to. And when I found that my business would take me near your town, I felt like I had to come here to see the place where the man who killed my child lived. I don't know why. Maybe I felt like I'd got get some closure. He chuckled ruefully. Closure. That's a real popular word, isn't it? I came here looking for it. And what I realized was that I had it in my own heart all along. I can't forgive the man who killed my daughter, but I can stop letting him ruin my life. I can move on. And that's what I intend to do. And that's what I want to tell all of you to do. You and you and you. He pointed out into the crowd. We humans have the capacity to wreak horrors on each other, but we also have the capacity to survive those horrors. You know, I was unfortunate enough to know 
your Miss Davis, but listening to everyone speak, I like to think he hesitated, and for a moment he seemed that he might just walk away from the microphone, but instead he gripped the lantern and went on. I like to think that maybe she would have been friends with my Harriet. Tears streamed down Fulton's face and his voice caught. So maybe now they both have a new friend in heaven. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Fulton staggered away from the podium to applause. Connie's cheeks were smeared with dampness that shifted in the flickering light of her candle and she clutched Jazz's hand as speaker after speaker extolled the virtues and wonderments that had once been Virginia Davis. Jazz tried to be sympathetic, but the truth was the crying and the wailing made him numb. Crying, he knew, was useless, an important lesson learned so young. Wakey, wakey, Jasper, my boy. And then, I'm doing Rusty tonight. You gotta help, but you gotta watch. Rusty had been Jazz's companion for the first eight years of his life. A mix of Cocker Spaniel and Retriever, the perfect color of soft caramel. They had romped and played in the backyard together and zoned out on the sofa watching TV together. And then one night, Jazz had watched as Billy gutted and flayed Rusty alive. Looking back, he was shocked at just how long the poor beast had lived in such unrelenting pain. But the time he knew only that his dog was dying was hurting, and there was nothing he could do about it. He cried, cried early and long and hard, the whole time Billy patiently stripped away Rusty's life with his knives. When Rusty was well and truly dead, nothing more than a wet, slick hump of muscle and bone with a second pile of flesh and intestines glistening in the corner, Billy came to him and knelt down next to his bawling son. He folded his arms around Jazz and whispered, It's okay. It's okay, in a soothing paternal tone, until Jazz had quieted enough to listen and understand what he said next, which was, You go on crying. You keep crying. It's all right. Jazz had needed no further encouragement. The tears kept coming, an endless gush of them, like a deep water well under pressure spewing its contents out into the world. He leaned into his father. Yes, he was a killer and a torturer, but he was Jazz's father and some biological imperative made his presence comforting. And Billy said, Close your eyes. And Jazz did, still weeping, the tears leaking out from his shut eyelids, and Billy held him. And when Jazz's sobs began to slow, Billy said in a voice with it that was almost kind, You need to open your eyes now, son. You need to see something. And Jazz did so, thinking magical, childish thoughts. But all he saw was the two piles, and then Billy, his voice jovial with a sinister uncurrent, said, See, Jasper? All that crying, and what did you accomplish? Nothing. And nothing. He looked around the football field. Every eye was aimed at the makeshift dais set up on the 50-yard line. Even Deputy Erickson was wrapped by the testimonials, standing to one side near a still visibly overcome Jeff Fulton. Every eye but one. Jazz couldn't believe it. There was Doug Weathers looking directly at Jazz, and now he was making his way through the crowd toward him. God, that guy was everywhere. Was nothing sacred to him? Nothing at all? A rage more powerful than any he'd ever known before bubbled up inside Jazz. He wanted to do horrible, unspeakable things to Weathers, things that culminated in Weathers begging for his own death. Jazz let those fantasies range free in his imagination, and it felt good. Serial killers often went to the funerals and memorials of their victims, Jazz knew. Billy had done so on more than one occasion, always taking care to be in disguise. It was a compulsion with many of them, a way of extending their perceived ownership of the victim, even beyond the act of murder. Ow, Connie whispered, Jazz! He was crushing her hand. He loosened his grip and whispered an apology, then let go of her hand completely and mumbled something lame about needing to get some fresh air. He pushed through the crowd, heading for the exit. Weathers changed direction, pressing through the crowd in Jazz's wake. Soon, 
Jazz emerged from the throng of mourners into one of the field's ensigns. The tunnel path 